The foreman didn't return that day, nor did we continue our work. We sat down and smoked. All of us were furious. Someone said, Let him try that just one more time. We'll show him. We'll show him what? Jan asked. We'll show him who does the work. We'll show him that we can do it without him, the man answered. That's a lie, Jan snapped. Do you think I'd repair these contraptions if no one forced me to do it? What on earth for? Everyone drew back when Jan said this. The others probably hadn't ever heard anyone express such an attitude. I drew back too, although I had heard such a view before, during my first prison term. Jan's attitude to work was identical to Manuel's. It was also similar to the attitude your young high school friend Ron expressed when he took you on your first tour of the city. To Jan, it wasn't the presence or absence of the foreman that made our work prostitution, but the fact that we sold our lives to a project that wasn't our own. At that time, I didn't understand him, just as I hadn't understood most of Manuel had told me in prison. Jan had expressed the same attitude six years earlier, during our agitational activity at the carton plant. Luisa still remembers him for that. In your second letter, you told me George Alberts had considered Jan and me, quote, destructive hooligans, and Luisa agreed with Alberts. It's not at all surprising that she included Ron and Manuel among the hooligans. According to Sabina, George Alberts thought that workers had fought a revolution in order to replace reactionary foremen with revolutionary foremen, that workers had fought a revolution in order to replace George Alberts in an important post. All those opposed to this, like Manuel, had to be swept out of the way. Where was Louisa when revolutionaries like Manuel were swept out of the way? Was she alongside the aspiring foreman Alberts, helping to sweep people like Ron, myself, Manuel, and Jan out of the way? She virtually admitted this when she said that, quote, such people were a greater threat to the revolution than the militarists. I'd really like to know where Louisa stood during this purge of saboteurs. I've long ago become suspicious of her interpretations. Your letters have made me wonder about her activity as well. Incidentally, I'd like to know how Albert succeeded in having you and Louisa released from prison 20 years ago. Sabina wants me to tell more about Manuel. Unfortunately, I knew him only in prison, and our conversations were neither very thorough nor were they very relaxed in the circumstances in which they took place. Also, at the time I knew him, I spent as much time defending Luisa's arguments as I spent listening to Manuel's. I didn't really understand Manuel's position until I worked with Jan at the bus repair depot, and even then I resisted the implications of that position. Emotionally, I agreed with Jan. His attitude to the work we did expressed exactly what I felt towards my job and towards my life. Emotionally, I also agreed with Manuel, and even while defending Luisa's arguments, I had known that I would have been among those of Manuel's friends who were jailed and killed as saboteurs. Intellectually, I must have held a view similar to the one Sabina expressed in your letter, although I don't remember that I had any intellectual view at all. I had only vague feelings. I suppose that I, like Sabina, thought that buses and factories were useful, and that their only dehumanizing characteristic was that they were managed by bureaucrats and policed by armed torturers and murderers. If we could only get rid of those predatory parasites, we would humanize the factories as well as ourselves. Such may have been my view when I drew back in response to Jan's comment after the scene with the foreman, and such may still be Savina's view today, but this view has nothing in common with Jan's or Manuel's. Manuel had nothing good to say about what Sabina, following Alberts, calls, quote, industrialization. Manuel's name for it was capital, and he called the revolutionary politicians who murdered his comrades capitalists. For Manuel, industrialization was merely another name for humanity's disease. It was a synonym for dehumanization. He called it capital because he didn't see it as a human activity, as a project launched by living individuals for themselves and for each other, but as a process that grew apart from them and against them, as a growth which they fed with their living energy, but which they didn't control. He had been with people who had temporarily defeated the forces that repressed them, had shared with them the experience of projecting a world that would be for human beings, and had watched most of those people reimpose on themselves the very forces they had defeated the day before because someone had told them industrialization was for them. He saw workers reshackle themselves to a process over which they had no control because someone convinced them their desire for their own life and their own project constituted sabotage and hooliganism. Manuel and Jan taught me that if we don't destroy the old life, whether we call it capital or progress or industrialization, and if we don't project and begin to create a new life, then we're only going to reenact our slavery on the graves of our fallen comrades, some of us managing and most of us managed, some of us repressing and all of us repressed. When Jan said he wouldn't repair any buses if a foreman didn't force him to, I drew back. I suspected that I wouldn't either, but I refused to draw any conclusions. I knew that on a superficial level, Jan's statement was false. 
since the only time any of us repaired any buses was when the foreman was out of our sight. But Jan meant something more profound, and it was this that I resisted. My resistance to his argument helps me understand why we still produce buses, bureaucrats, and bombs. I resisted because I worried for the buses. I wondered who would repair them and produce them if the revolution I had in mind ever took place and overthrew all foremen and formers and influential comrades. I worried for the future of capital. It was only years later that I began to ask myself who had decided that several of us were to spend parts of our lives repairing buses. This certainly wasn't the project of the living individuals engaged in it. None among the living, nor even among those who had lived before, had ever come together and decided that this activity was to be the content of our lives. It was as if we had no choice in the matter, as if we were irredeemably condemned to spend our lives at forced labor. The progress of things determined the content of our lives. Things defined us, things dominated us, and things consumed us. And when Jan expressed the desire to run out from under them and let them crash, I worried, not for myself or for any of us, but for the things. I wondered how the things would fare when we were no longer under them. I knew we had the ability to communicate, to determine our own individual and collective projects, to launch them together and to enjoy our common creation. I knew that such abilities were inherent to our being, that they were our very essence, if we have a specific essence, that they were neither aberrations or utopian dreams. I knew this with as much certainty as I know that my heart beats, because I feel it. Yet every day I negated my being, I suppressed it. Every day of my life I nursed the thing. I worried for it, I repaired it. I cringed under it and died for it. The progress of the thing matters more to us than our development, more than the flowering of our own capabilities. It is more important than our lives. If the progress of the thing ever requires us to stop breathing, I wonder if we'll be flexible and accommodating enough to do that for it as well. I drew back from Jan's conclusions, but I couldn't draw back from the experiences that had led Jan to those conclusions. I couldn't draw back from the world I lived in. I couldn't keep myself from experiencing what I still refused to believe, that the thing didn't exist for me, but only for itself, that its well-being coincided with my immiseration, that its progress was built on my stagnation. The day after our confrontation with the foreman, I went to work at the usual hour. When I reached the entrance to the depot, two men in street clothes rushed towards me, grabbed me by the arms, and dragged me to the back seat of the car. Jan was already there. He laughed when I was placed next to him and shouted, What's this? Have you ever seen these gentlemen before? Did you ever have anything to do with them? I thought we were having an argument with the foreman, an argument that concerned only us and the foreman. Are these gentlemen the foreman's relatives or his personal bodyguard? We were taken to the police station. I felt frustrated and, and indignant. It wasn't hard to surmise where the foreman had gone the previous day after he had cringed away from the circle of angry workers surrounding him. Nor was it surprising that going directly to the police would have been the normal reflex for this individual who had started his career as a police informer. What was so frustrating and so revealing was that all this took place without any communication among the individuals who were involved. Nothing was discussed, nothing was decided by the workers in the depot. The whole matter was settled by the foreman and the police, by the agents of order, by the agents of an order that doesn't concern those who maintain it because it isn't theirs and doesn't exist for them. They merely undergo it as their lot. Everything that happened at the police station was predictable, except the fact that we weren't sentenced to a new prison term. We were locked into a room with nothing in it except a bench. Jan grumbled, here we go again. We were both con convinced that we were going to spend the next few years, perhaps the rest of our lives, in prison. We sat quietly and waited. Jan stared at the blank wall. His laughter was gone. I started to cry, not because I would miss my walks in the park, wearing my suit and pushing Vesna's carriage, but because that activity suddenly seemed so ludicrous, such a miserable way to use up life's time. I cried because I would miss all that I hadn't done, all the possible lives I had failed to live. I thought of a story I had read about a man who realized only on his deathbed that during all his years in the world, he hadn't once lived. We were wrong. The repressive apparatus decided to dispose of us in a more economical way, without incurring the cost of maintaining us. We were summoned to the office of what must have been the station's head bureaucrat, as soon as we were seated, the bureaucrat turned to me and, fumbling with a dossier that must have been mine, asked, Are you Yaristan Bocek? Would you believe me if I told you I wasn't? I asked. Pointing his forefinger at me, the bureaucrat threatened, If you parade as Moran Sedlak one more time, you'll be in prison for fraud. Do you understand that? Jan and I looked at each other. We were relieved. If and one more time meant that we weren't going to be in prison this time. We wanted to laugh. The bureaucrat turned to Jan and, with the same threatening tone, said, 
You know that you can both get ten years for insulting and beating a foreman. Jan didn't respond. You could get another ten years for instigating a riot inside a workplace, and another for wrecking social means of production. All this on top of your criminal record would land you in prison for life, the bureaucrat said, threateningly but calmly, as if he were explaining a mathematical problem to us. Both of us stared at him. We no longer felt like laughing. He continued, We're not going to imprison you. We don't run a nursery for wild beasts. That explained our good fortune. Parade under false names one more time. Go into or near the bus depot for any reason whatever. Wreck any more social property. Fight with the same or another representative of the working class. And we'll take care of you. This time, permanently. Do you understand that? We were being told that we would be exterminated like wild beasts if we protected ourselves from abuse one more time. We were being fired from our jobs. We were being given a picture of our future, either to live as dead things or else not to live at all. We were being deprived of uncertainty. Yes, I answered. We understand that. The small amount of conventional happiness Myrna and I had nursed with such loving care disintegrated all around us. We could enjoy the illusory satisfaction offered by the objects only if we served them. As soon as we stopped serving them, we learned that they were not for us, but that we were for them. The moment we transgressed the rules of progress and found ourselves alone with our rewards, the objects lost their auras and revealed their essence. They were garbage. I returned to our apartment long before the end of the working day. Myrna started crying before I even told her Jan and I had been arrested. She knew as soon as I walked in that I'd been fired. The previous night I had told her about our encounter with the foreman. Her only comment had been, What'll become of us? I had been angered by her comment because I'd interpreted it to mean, What'll become of our curtains? the bedspread, Vesna's carriage, and our Sunday clothes. I had been angered mainly because I had shared exactly the same concern. I had worried for the objects. When I told Myrna what happened at the police station, she started to tremble. Her face took on an expression of undisguised, raw fear. She threw herself at me, sobbing and shaking, and uttered weakly, They can't, Yarostan, they can't. Myrna saw what I had seen a few hours earlier while waiting with Jan in the room at the police station. She saw how ludicrously poor our lives had become since the day when we'd started pouring them into our objects. We stopped worrying for the objects and started worrying for ourselves. We became aware of our own lives for the first time only when we began to be hounded, when we faced the danger of losing them. The day was a beginning, but not the kind of beginning Myrna had looked forward to. It was the beginning of our persecution. From that day on, we were hounded so persistently that we never again had the opportunity to worry about the future of our objects. That day was the beginning of our human lives. We ceased to be objects in a world of objects. We ceased to be things that produced and things that consumed. I began to understand Jan's outlook as well as Manuel's. Only two days after Jan and I were briefed by the police bureaucrat, there was a knock at the door. Myrna jumped up as if a cannon had exploded. She backed against the wall, pale with fear. The moment misfortune begins, all news is bad news, and every change is likely to be a change for the worse. I let in a man who introduced himself as the president of the neighborhood council. His eyes didn't once stop shifting from side to side. He was as suspicious as a mouse sitting in the middle of a room, ready at any instant to flee back into its hole. He even studied Vesna with apprehension, probably fearing that her paw would fly out and claw his face before he'd had a chance to defend himself or escape. Years later, our neighbor, the police informer, Mr. Nanovo, reminded me of this council president. The president announced, as if he were reading, although he didn't have a text, quote, At its last deliberative session, the neighborhood council resolved that convicted criminals and other parasites who suck the blood of working people will not be harbored within the living units of said council. Myrna started to bawl, and Vesna joined her. I flung the door wide open, grabbed the president by the back of the collar, and sent him flying out of our apartment with a kick in the rear, so as to justify the need for his vigilance, his suspiciousness, and the constant shifting of his eyes. Myrna became hysterical. She was sure the police would come to arrest me for the last time because of the way I had treated the council president. I tried to remain calm by telling her the president's behavior had in indicated that he hadn't expected to be treated any other way. But as soon as her fear for my arrest receded, she started worrying about our situation. She convinced herself that the neighborhood council had no right to evict us, since they didn't even live in our building. She talked me into taking our predicament to the neighbors. I agreed with the principle of doing this, but I assured her that our neighbors had no more power to stop our eviction than we did. Right or wrong, the neighborhood council had the police behind them. Even so, I went with Myrna to knock on the doors of our neighbors' apartments. This was a mistake. It only informed us of how alone we were. One of the women downstairs opened the door and immediately slammed it in our faces. None of the others let us into their apartments. 
We were forced to stand in the doorways and explain our situation, as if we were dirty beggars asking for food. And as we spoke, we heard the doors we just left open slightly. Apparently, people wanted to hear our story a second, and then a third, and even a fourth time, or else they were eavesdropping so as to hear what the others would tell us. When we reached our third or fourth door, the man interrupted us before we were finished and said, I'm sorry for you, but really, you should have told us you were a convicted criminal. The next neighbor interrupted us almost as soon as we began, and she made the advice more succinct. You should have told the council you were convicts. Myrna angrily grabbed the woman by the shoulders and shouted, You idiot! We're workers just like you! Convicts are people who are inside prison, and most of them are workers too. The woman was apparently intimidated. She said, I'm sorry for you, backed away from us, and closed her door. We heard the next door close while we walked towards it. We knocked, and the man shouted, I don't talk to criminals! I got furious, and, banging on the door with all the strength in my arms, I shouted, That's because you're a pig! and pigs never talk to human beings. We didn't knock on the remaining three or four doors. We didn't have the nerve. We were defeated. All of our neighbors were workers. There wasn't a single clerical worker, student, or bureaucrat official in the building. According to your friend Damon, workers are, quote, inherently revolutionary. I suppose what he means by this is identical to what our neighborhood council president would mean. Damon doesn't mean all workers. He means those workers who have learned to submit to authority, those workers who would be willing to obey any authority that speaks in their name those who would be willing to evict and ultimately to maim and kill other workers for the sake of a politician who considers them, quote, inherently revolutionary. Damon is a politician or a saint. In his mouth, revolutionary means the same as blessed and is merely a way to flatter his future followers. Our situation was similar to the one I had faced during the weeks after I had been released from prison. We had no place to go and I had no job. We still had some savings, but now there were three of us. We were stained, exactly the way Jews had been stained during the occupation. Only now there was no resistance movement. The dregs of that movement had replaced the previous occupiers. The rest of the movement had been slaughtered during the three days and nights of senseless butchery. If we found another apartment, we would be hounded out as soon as the police informed our neighbors that we were, quote, convicts. I couldn't find a job for the same reason. I didn't even think of looking for one. I knew I'd have the same luck I'd had before. I'm sorry, comrade, but with your record, we, we can't afford... We went to Jan for help and advice. He was able to remain in the apartment of his former fellow worker, and as a result, he was able to communicate our situation to the other workers in the depot. The police had told us to stay away from the depot. They hadn't told Jan to move out of his apartment. I suppose the police had expected Jan to be evicted the same way we were, but Jan's friend, not being a criminal, had managed to reason with his neighbors, convincing him that Jan couldn't be evicted since the apartment wasn't in his name. He was simply a guest. Jan said that he would contact Titus Zebron once again about our getting another job. He'd have to telephone Tybr Titus to, to avoid being arrested, since Titus's office was next door to the bus depot. As for our housing problem, Jan looked sadly at Myrna and suggested that we move back to their parents' house, at least until I found another source of income. Myrna swallowed her pride together with her life streams and took Jan's advice. We moved back to the fringes of the city, back to the yards with chickens and vegetable gardens, back to the neighborhood, which was no longer a village, but was not yet part of the city. We packed our curtains, our bedspread, and our Sunday clothes. We wouldn't need them where we were going. Vesna's carriage had to be transported on a truck. We were ashamed of it when it arrived. There were no baby carriages on the unpaved streets where Myrna's parents lived. They weren't built for such streets. We stored the carriage in what had been Jan's room and covered it with an old sheet. Unlike an old trunk after a journey's end, it couldn't be used as a storage box, nor as a seat or surface. It had no use at all. It was simply a large mistake. What upset Myrna most of all was that she thought that Vesna would grow up in the environment where Myrna had grown up, that Vesna would be brought up by Myrna's religious mother, and that Vesna's whole life would consist of experiences like the one we had just undergone. I argued that there was no reason to project our misfortune into the child's life, but ultimately it was Myrna who turned out to be right. When we told Myrna's father what we had undergone, he nodded with approval for what Jan and I had done. He said, You can't teach mules to fly referring to those who had evicted us. His conclusion was as fatalistic as his wife's. That's how it is. What matters is that you're alive and well. Worse things have happened. In other words, a healthy horse can still be made serviceable. Only a lame horse is good for nothing. In his view, our adventure was nothing more than a temporary setback, comparable at worst to a healthy and vigorous peasant's loss of a year's crop. Next year was another year, and if we stayed alive and well, we'd surely emerge with a better crop, perhaps even coming out as far ahead as we'd fallen behind. He was still convinced that I would go far, perhaps to bureaucratic office, perhaps even to the university. But he noticed that I talked less, and sometimes not at all. He suspected that something had gone wrong, 
One evening during dinner, he asked me, half-jokingly, What's the matter with you, boy? Have you lost your politics? This is no time to lose that type of talent. Myrna's mother didn't share Sedlak's high opinion of me. She had seen me as an omen, an evil omen, since the day when I first came to her house. I didn't learn this until several years later, because she didn't say anything at all at the time. She saw me as hell's messenger, sent from afar to bring destruction, misery, and death to the entire family. Everything I had done until then confirmed the suspicion, or rather, this certainty, since she didn't once show that she doubted the truth of her initial impression. The newest episode showed her that I had already started to carry out my destructive assignment. Di by taking part in Jan's fight with the foreman, and especially by calling myself Murr and Sedlak, I had caused Jan to get into far more trouble than he'd have gotten into by himself. It's possible that this was when she linked me to Jan's first arrest, since a few years later she was going to blame me for everything that had happened to Jan, and she knew that Jan and I had been arrested together six years earlier at the carton plant. Finally, by getting myself evicted, I was starting to bring pain and humiliation into Myrna's life, and even into Vesta's life. I didn't know these details at the time, but I sensed her intense hostility towards me, a hostility that couldn't be pacified with a kindly gesture, a pleasant word, or a smile. Myrna and I helped with the housework, read a little, took care of Vesna, and waited. There was snow on the ground, and we rarely left the house. In any case, Myrna no longer had inclinations to take walks in that familiar neighborhood. We waited for something to change for the better. Our main hope was Jan. We waited for him to come with good news about a job, perhaps about an apartment. Jan came, but not with good news. He had telephoned Titus Zabram. Titus knew about our firing. He told Jan that our situation was made difficult by the fact that the police had reported our behavior to the trade union bureaucracy, and consequently no official would be willing to hire us, even with, quote, pull. But he told Jan he would continue to try and find a, quote, place for us. Myrna grew increasingly frustrated and impatient. We can't simply sit here and wait, she insisted. Nothing is ever going to happen here. Absolutely nothing. She decided to try and get a job on her own. First she went out with a newspaper. Then she started to ask young women on bus buses what kind of jobs they had and where their factories were located. She visited every factory she could find. After three or four weeks of daily journeys to large and small workshops, she found a job in a clothing factory not far from the carton plant. She announced it with a certain amount of pride, but without a trace of the childlike optimism with which she had greeted earlier changes. Already before she started to work, her passion and her pride were mixed with a certain resignation, a certain helplessness in the face of an indifferent, arbitrary, and cruel environment. She became increasingly silent, increasingly patient. Her life's dreams continued receding. Myrna became a member of the working class, but not on her own terms. She became a wage worker, a citizen of capital. She described her job with one word, drudgery. In the clothing factory, she learned boredom, the endless repetition of the same motions, the gloomy foreknowledge that the following day, week, and year would become the same as all yesterdays. Her daily activity enriched humanity only in clothes. It consumed Myrna, swallowed all her projects, extinguished her hopes. By becoming a member of the working class, she annihilated the possibility to become a member of a human community. She gave away the time and energy necessary for the creation of that community. The resignation Myrna expressed the first day she worked in the clothing factory was the resignation of a person whose life is no longer one's own, of a beast of burden. About a month after Myrna started working, Jan learned about a job for him and me. Titus Zabron had actually gone to Jan's apartment to tell him about the job. A steel plant in a small town about 100 kilometers from the city was short of unskilled laborers. There were not enough workers in the town or the surrounding villages to supply the needed labor force, and city workers were either unwilling to move or unwilling to travel such great distance twice a day. Consequently, the plant officials were looking to overlook our prison past as well as our employment records. Titus suggested that Jan and I accept the job, assuring him that such emergency situations were the best we could expect under the circumstances, and that the next emergency might not pay as high a wage as the steel plant. Myrna refused to hear of our traveling 100 kilometers away. I argued that we apparently had no other choice. Jan suggested that we postpone making our decision until he learned more about the job. Jan came again two weeks later on a weekend. He told us that housing was cheap and plentiful in the steel town and that he was going to rent an apartment near the plant. He urged us to do the same. Myrna burst out crying, turned to the wall, and beat her fist against it. She shouted, I don't want either of you so far away from me, in the wilderness. Jan sadly told her, the heart of this city is the only wilderness in this part of the world. Myrna turned to Jan with a look of desperation and said, falteringly, I'll kill myself before I go there. I'm going to stay in the city, and I'll support Vesna as well as both of you for the rest of my life, if necessary.
Myrna, don't be a mule, Jan pleaded. You're not living in the city now, and we don't have a choice. Myrna told us, they're building houses for workers near my factory. Several women in my department have already signed up. I'm going to sign up to buy one. And what do you pay for it with? Jan asked. Your wages don't support Vesna or Yaristan. Father supports them. He gets twice as much as you do. In the steel plant, I'll be paid three times what you get. They told me I'd get a raise, Myrna said. When? Jan asked. In two years. Two years! Jan exclaimed. And will you, when will you buy your house? Myrna collapsed into a chair and cried. I don't know, she said desperately. But I don't want you to go there, and I don't want Vesna to grow up there. I suggested a compromise. We could move back to the city if I took the job in the steel plant. That way, we could afford to buy the house and stop being a burden to your father. You'd spend half the day traveling, Myrna objected. I said, I don't see any other acceptable alternative. Myrna didn't say anything. I decided to take the job. Jan moved to an apartment near the plant. A certain feeling of happiness accompanies self-realization. During those days, I learned that another type of happiness accompanies resignation. I was convinced that I had no other choice, and I resigned myself to a 12-hour working day, four hours of which I spent going to and from the plant. As soon as I resigned myself to that situation, everything became easier and more pleasant than I had expected it to be. I experienced lesser pains as pleasures. The work was hard. It consisted of shoveling scraps of hot metal into a moving conveyor belt. We sweated in winter. In summer, the place became an unbearable inferno. Small wonder that other workers didn't want to travel a hundred kilometers for the sake of such activity. But on the other hand, the foreman didn't take his job seriously and was in no way different from any other worker. No one had been willing to accept the task, and the workers had drawn lots to determine which one of their names would be entered as foreman on the official forms. As a result, there was no supervision. The people I worked with were among the freest human beings I've ever encountered inside a factory or prison. The time I spent traveling used up what remained of my living day. I got up every day long before sunrise. I rode a tram and a bus to the train station, and then spent nearly an hour and a half on the train. I returned home long after sunset, dirty and exhausted. I bathed, ate, and collapsed into a bed. Six days a week. I degenerated as a being with specific capacities, with the power to create. I stagnated. Whatever potentialities I had were stunted. Please mention this to Sabina. What she calls industrialization is impossible without steel. That process is not our project. It's not for us. It thrives only by destroying us. However, since I was resigned, even the discomfort of spending so many hours a day traveling contained a pleasure. I took books with me and read on the train every morning, philosophy, history, science, as well as several novels. I was fascinated. I even came to look forward to my train ride to work. On my way back home at night, I was usually too tired to read. As soon as I started working, I insisted that Myrna quit her job. I argued that since my wages were three times hers, we could easily support ourselves and also move on what I earned. So there was no reason for both of us to turn ourselves into oxen. But Myrna was adamant. If she quit her job, she wouldn't be able to buy the house she'd signed up for, since those houses were earmarked for workers in her plant. That would mean we'd have to rent another apartment, and would again be subject to victimization by the bureaucrats who administered them. She also insisted that she'd never be fired from her job as a troublemaker, whereas there was no telling how long I'd keep my job. Myrna was determined not to let anything like our eviction happen again, and she was equally determined to move out of her mother's house and into the housing complex near her factory. I asked who would replace her mother as Vesta's nurse when both of us were working, but learned that the planners had already removed this obstacle to the unfettered development of the productive forces. The children were going to spend the day in a nursery while their parents reproduced capital. Myrna's application was accepted. The house was built, and we moved in. It's the house in which I'm writing this letter. Myrna still works in the clothing factory a few blocks from here. Today, there are blocks of similar houses. Streets are paved. There are street lights and sidewalks, and a bus stop half a block from our house. When we moved here, there were neither blocks, nor streets, nor lights. It was late spring. Our house and two of its neighbors stood in a pool of mud with trails consisting of narrow, slippery planks of wood. Our baby carriage was as useless here as it had been at the Sedlak's house. The house was built for workers, which meant that it was built shoddily. The roof began to leak during our first heavy rainfall. During my second prison term, Myrna had to have the entire roof replaced. The plaster on the walls and ceilings had cracked and left large fissures. The foundation was set in mud, and one side of the house has been sinking ever since we moved in. Everything in the house stands at an angle. We got used to that. In fact, we got used to everything. The jobs, the mud, the nursery. What mattered to Myrna was that there were no chickens and no gardens. Eventually, there were small front lawns. Only grass grew on them, and we didn't even plant our own grass. That was done for us by the builders. We only mowed it. What mattered was that we finally had our house in the city, and no one could evict us from it.
We were happy in our new house. It was the happiness of permanent exiles, of survivors from a shipwreck or a war. It was the happiness of wage workers resigned to their lot, the kind of happiness that comes with resignation. We had shed almost everything, our dreams, our projects, our unrealized potentialities, and our unused abilities. Consequently, we embraced what little we had retained with all the joy that was in us. We threw ourselves into the project of fixing our little house with the same enthusiasm with which we might have joined human beings building a new world. I wasn't able to do much during the week, but every Sunday I would become a master carpenter and painter. Myrna worked every night and did most of the building and decorating. We built our own bed and tables, and for chairs we used backless stools. In time we again had enough money to buy what we needed, but the main thing we bought was a sofa. Wood as well as paint were plentiful, while the housing complex was being built since the quantities we needed were always available in the scrap piles. We left all our earlier purchases packed away. Myrna made all the curtains and bedding as well as our clothes. We spent our money only on food and saved the rest. Myrna insisted on saving money for the same reason that she had insisted on buying the house. She didn't want to be dependent on a world she couldn't trust. She didn't want to be at the mercy of a merciless bureaucracy ever again. Myrna, Vesna, and I had lived in our house for a year when I started to hear rumors about a vast uprising breaking out in Magarna. I say rumors because every account I heard contradicted the previous one. The press organized a systematic campaign to create ignorance and confusion. I don't know what I would have thought of you if I had received the letter you sent me at that time, describing your newspaper activity as your life's project and reporters as your community. The newspaper's systematic falsification of the acts of the Magarna workers convinced me that the press was an instrument of domination and couldn't be anything else. You commented on the press's falsification of the Magarna events, but you suggested this was due to the bias of the reporters, or owners, and not to the very nature of the instrument. I think you fail to grasp something about the press, probably because you were so deeply involved with it. You fail to understand that instruments of domination and destruction can't be used for anything else. Surely it's obvious to you that a bomb doesn't become a benevolent instrument if it's controlled by a benevolent person. A newspaper destroys communication as certainly as a bomb destroys life. And this was plainly visible during the Magarna uprising. The people who reported the Magarna events were not like the people engaged in the events, just as they were not like Jan or Myrna or her parents or me. They were different, not because of their views or their biases, but because of their activity. These differences didn't reside in the personal benevolence or ma malevolence of the reporters, but in the instrument they served. Gross, unbridgeable chasms separated two groups of people engaged in mutually antagonistic activities. The workers of Magarna were desperately trying to cease to be what they were, to free themselves from the routine that had repressed them, while the reporters made no effort to cease to be what they were, but on the contrary threw themselves passionately into their special routine. The Magarna workers were desperately trying to communicate directly with each other and with their likes elsewhere, while the reporters were spreading their reportages between like and like, interpreting each to the other, portraying each to the other through a glass that didn't reflect the experiences of the individual on the other side, but only the reporters. The workers were struggling for lives which were not interpreted, defined, mediated, or represented, while the newspapers could only interpret, define, mediate, and represent, because that's their essential purpose, their nature. Locked into the world of representations, the reporters couldn't see a struggle against representations as anything than a struggle between one representation and another. I'm not even mentioning the fact that almost all the reporters were actual agents of the state, officials who earned their livelihood by falsifying workers' struggles. Newspapers can't coexist with or serve human beings fighting to abolish reportage and create communication. They're based on the impossibility of community. This is what I was learning about newspapers 12 years ago when you were writing me about your newspaper articles. I didn't see your letter. I can't guess if I would have been angry or pleased. I know I wouldn't have been pleased by your high regard for our activity at the carton plant eight years earlier, nor by your enthusiasm for the press. But I think one aspect of your letter would have pleased me very much. Your letter was an attempt at direct communication between two individuals separated by impenetrable political and geographical barriers an instance of the communication the Magarna workers were desperately struggling to create. Maybe it was this characteristic of your letter that antagonized the authorities. Maybe their fear of direct communication across their frontiers is far greater than our trust in it. Maybe the ultimate concern of the state is to keep such communication from taking place. That's the central purpose of the fences and the walls, the censors and the paid liars. Letters like yours vanish in normal times. It would have been a miracle if such a letter had reached its destination in a time of crisis. I can believe that such a letter would have been confiscated, and even that a messenger carrying such letters would have been arrested. 
But I still can't believe that Jan and I could have been arrested merely because such letters were addressed to us, and before we had even seen them. This possibility would be slightly more plausible if we hadn't been doing anything at the time. If I had remained in the stupor of resignation, if I had continued to channel all my energy and enthusiasm into Sunday afternoon repairing and decorating of the interior of this house. It wasn't your letter, but the event you asked about in that letter, the Magarna uprising, that woke me from that stupor and shamed me in the face of my resignation. When I heard the first rumors of a widespread rising, I paid no attention to them. It's not that I thought they weren't true. I had learned during my first imprisonment that such rumors contained descriptions of real events. I began to take an interest in Jan, when Jan and several other workers brought newspapers into the steel plant. The fanaticism with which the newspapers denied all the rumors indicated that at least some of them weren't only true, but also current. However, what confirmed the rumors wasn't the press, but direct communication with Magarna workers. One of the workers in the steel plant pretended to be ill and went to visit his family, who lived in a small village on the frontier of Magarna and had relatives across the frontier. He succeeded in evading the border guards and in communicating with his relatives. As soon as he returned from the, his village, all the workers in our section of the plant gathered around him like flies, questioning him about every, de every detail of what he had learned. Jan was the most persistent. He simply couldn't stop asking questions, and he repeatedly asked the same questions. He couldn't believe what he heard. Somewhere in the world, people just like us had started doing exactly what Jan had always wanted to do. They had started to break the chain that shackled them to the monster that consumed them. They had started to move for themselves. Our fellow worker wasn't able to answer several of Jan's questions, and I still don't know the answers today. He told us that repressive old functionaries were being ousted from their posts, but couldn't tell us if they were being replaced by repressive new functionaries in similar posts. He told us workers' councils were being formed in factories and workshops, but couldn't tell us the extent to which politicians and their organizations were behind the councils. Jan repeatedly asked, are they doing this for themselves or for the productive forces? This couldn't be answered either. Yet in spite of all the unanswered questions, it was clear to us that a population had begun to stir, that ancient social structures had started to crumble. People like ourselves had suddenly turned against the apparatus into which they had been pouring their lives. We didn't know if they were determined to recover their whole lives or if they were only looking for halfway stations, if their struggle was being channeled into dead ends. But wherever their struggle ended, we were convinced that it had begun as a struggle against the entire social apparatus that had shaped individuals into tools that served its ends. Wherever they were eventually channeled, it was clear that the workers of Magarna had stopped being workers, and by that act had already made the impossible possible. They had already created the fields in which jobs could give way to projects and production to creation. I don't think I could have answered any of your questions. I didn't know any more about the Magarna struggle than you did. Our fellow worker's visit to his family was the only direct information we had. My, my nearness to Magarna was counteracted by a more total suppression of information. I was convinced, as you were, that a revolution had broken out. A revolution as extensive and profound as the one Louisa had experienced. It was during those events that I began to question Louisa's interpretation of her experience and to contrast it with Manuel's accounts. It was then that I began to understand Manuel's as well as Jan's arguments. It became clear to me that if there were workers in Magarna whose job had been to shovel scraps of burning hot metal onto a conveyor belt, those workers couldn't possibly be motivated by the desire to shovel the same burning scraps onto the same conveyor belt, quote, on their own. We didn't need strikes, barricades, or bloodshed for that. We were already doing that on our own. This was clear not only, only to Jan and me, but to everyone I worked with. This was also clear to Myrna, despite the fact that supervision, as well as the noise at her clothing factory, made communication impossible, despite the fact that after work she didn't talk to anyone, but ran directly to the nursery to pick up Vesna. Quote, Officials we've never seen before walk up and down the aisles, she told me. And they're so nervous, so afraid, they act as if at any instant we were going to walk off with the machinery and the clothing. If only we had the nerve. Discussion of the Magarna events was almost impossible at Myrna's factory as it was in most other factories and workshops. But it wasn't impossible at the plant where Jan and I worked, certainly not in our section. There were no aisles in which police agents could walk up and down, and the heat in which we worked didn't motivate any officials to take an interest in our conversations. I've already mentioned that our foreman was a foreman only on paper, and consequently, we weren't supervised. I'm also convinced that there were no police agents among us. The authorities had a hard enough time finding people willing to do the shoveling. We were unsupervised, but we were also completely isolated from all the other workers in the steel plant. From the moment we entered our section of the plant to the moment we left, we hardly saw anyone who didn't work in our section. 
This didn't prevent several of my fellow workers from trying to communicate with others. The communication took place after work hours in the restaurants and bars, on the street corners, and in the park of the steel town. It was direct, face-to-face -face communication. It didn't pay take place through a newspaper, like the one your friend Damon described, a, quote, workers' newspaper. The very existence of such a newspaper would have replaced and ultimately suppressed the type of communication that took place. One individual exchanged views and feelings with another. Before long, everyone in the steel plant, perhaps everyone in the town, felt what the Magarna workers must have felt on the eve of their revolution, the desire as well as the ability to throw off their chains. In spite of the deafening noise and the unbearable heat, my workplace turned into a discussion club. Every day someone had heard more rumors that had slipped across the border. Every day the press confirmed the rumors with its fanatical denials and distortions. We discussed the implications and prospects of every act. We discussed our own possibilities and prospects. And we knew that similar discussions were taking place elsewhere in the plant, if only because fewer and fewer wagons of metal passed through our section. The entire town could have been located in Magarna. It responded to events in Magarna as if they were taking place inside the steel plant. Unfortunately, I didn't take part in the all-night discussions that took place after work in the restaurants and bars. I would have had to catch a train that left three hours later and thus eliminate the small amount of time I spent with Myrna and Vesna. But Jan's accounts of these meetings and discussions made me feel that I had taken part in them. Whenever two or more people met, they exchanged, not greetings, but news from Magarna. Before long, all were shouting, each outdoing the other and denouncing the lies fabricated by the press. Although formal meetings were banned, steelworkers who met informally in bars and restaurants talked about writing letters to the newspapers, about passing resolutions criticizing the press, about sending delegations to the newspaper offices, and even about going on strike for the sake of honest information about the revolution in Magarna. I was enthusiastic about all the suggestions and proposals, but my enthusiasm was dampened by Jan's misgivings. Jan was enthusiastic too, but only about the fact that the human beings around us had come to life and started to stir. He considered the agitation around the press a wasteful expenditure of energy that couldn't find other outlets. Jan stated his misgivings to others whenever the occasion arose, but he did so quietly, without insistence, without a politician's rhetoric or a missionary's self-righteousness. He was convinced that what was clear to him would sooner or later become clear to everyone. It did become clear to me, and perhaps to many others, that our agitation for an honest press was grounded in an illusion that this activity was a substitute for the real activity we were unwilling or unable to launch. What became perfectly obvious to me is illustrated by your experience on the university's newspaper staff. Your activity was the type of, quote, honest journalism we were agitating for. But when you practiced this honest journalism, authority immediately suppressed the newspaper. You claimed that this suppression was caused by the spinelessness of the university administrators. You're wrong. Your newspaper was suppressed because it had stopped carrying out its function. The newspaper is an instrument by which the ruling minority shapes the conceptions of the majority. Quote, honest journalism it's not its, is not its function, but its mask. Those in power may at times tolerate honest journalism, but only if they consider it harmless. Your own experience proves this. Authority had only to place its signature on a, quote, directive, and your honest journalism vanished. Your attitude to this as, is as ridiculous as the idea that a general's brain can be warmonger while his mouth and his other organs are pacifists. The newspaper is an organ of the rulers. It serves those in power, or else it is nothing. It doesn't exist. That's why our agitation for an honest press was a waste of time. I'm not talking about honest reporters. We heard about honest reporters after they were fired. Resolutions were passed and sent to newspapers. Letters were written. There were several brief work stoppages at the plant. But I sensed a general feeling of frustration. We seemed to be in constant motion, but we remained where we'd been before. The newspapers obviously didn't publish our letters or resolutions, nor did they give the slightest indication that similar activity was taking place elsewhere. But the newspapers weren't the cause of our inability to communicate with our likes elsewhere. They were merely a symptom of that inability. What made direct communication with our likes impossible was the absence of community, the fact that intermediaries stood between ourselves and our likes. We didn't know how to bypass the intermediaries, nor how to extend our hands to those who stood on the other side. That's why we turned to the intermediaries themselves for help, asking them to reflect accurately what our brothers were saying and doing, asking them to communicate our words and our gestures to our brothers. But the intermediaries, the professional interpreters and ideological specialists, could communicate and reflect only their own words and gestures. They could display only the insights derived from their own mode of living. We thought we had nowhere else to turn, and we convinced ourselves that if only the intermediaries reflected a portion of the truth about the Magarna workers' struggle,
and if only they communicated our desires to take part in that struggle, then workers elsewhere would begin to rise as well. If the intermediaries could only be brought to our side, if their instruments could only be made to serve our struggle, the police-run regimes would tear at the seams into factories, workshops, and mines. We were wrong. Such instruments couldn't be made to serve our struggle. Such intermediaries couldn't communicate our desires. They separated worker from worker and brother from brother, like fortified walls standing between them. The only one who moved in response to another's motion was one who communicated with the other face to face. One who depended on intermediaries for information depended on them also for guidance, motion, and life. The workers in my section of the plant succeeded in communicating with the rest of the workers in the plant. But that was the beginning and the end of our success. To go beyond the plant, we turned to intermediaries. Just as to reach their comrades elsewhere, the Magarna workers turned to intermediaries. And the intermediaries they turned to turned against them. Workers in tanks murdered their brothers on the streets of Magarna. The workers in the tanks had been informed about the struggle, not by those engaged in it, but by politicians' speeches and newspaper articles. Their gestures were guided, not by the sense of solidarity with their likes, but by submission to the commands of superiors. They aimed and fired without scruple or hesitation, because they couldn't see their opponents. Their vision was blocked, not by the metal casing surrounding them, but by the ideological casing that gripped their minds. They aimed at the demons described by the speeches in newspapers. They fired at images, but they killed human beings. The Magarna workers couldn't aim or fire with the same lack of scruple, with the same certainty, because they knew that their scruples and their uncertainties were only a few days old. They knew that only a few days earlier, they too had known about each other, only what they'd seen on the opaque screens that stood between them. They hesitated before they fired, but those in the tanks didn't hesitate. For a moment, our stupor and our resignation gave way to hope, to the anticipation of a life where large projects are possible, where dreams can be realized in the company of vibrant, imaginative, and sympathetic human beings. But our hopes were short-lived. The society held together by the market and the police didn't disintegrate. Magarna workers were buried in mass graves, and our hopes were buried with them. We hadn't been able to add anything more than hopes to their struggle. Our gestures had remained confined within boundaries we hadn't created, boundaries we hadn't been able to cross. Something like your journalistic project had been all we had reached for during a moment where a universe of possibilities wasn't very far from our grasp. We called for good intermediaries instead of creating conditions in which no intermediaries could thrive. We called for an honest press instead of forging our own communication as our first step toward the creation of our own community. The people of Magarna had started to struggle for such a community. They were isolated and defeated. They were isolated from us, from those like us, who remained fascinated by all or part of the glitter of the monarch's world. We were isolated too, but we weren't defeated. We hadn't even begun to struggle. Yarostan.